So this is our last lecture on the Civil War itself, and next week we will start looking at the Reconstruction period after the war. But in, and uh, you know, conventionally, if you look at American history textbooks, etc., Reconstruction is dated 1865, end of the war, to 1877. But in fact, Reconstruction did not begin in 1865. It began during the Civil War. Um, from the, I mean, obviously, from the very outset of the war, the question was on people's minds in the North, if the Union emerged victorious, what would that mean for the South? At the beginning of the war, the term Reconstruction wasn't really widely used. The term used was restoration, restoration. In other words, the states would come back pretty much as they had been, legally speaking, with their social institutions uh, intact. This was the position of the Lincoln administration at the beginning of the war. Remember, secession was null and void. It was illegal. It was unconstitutional. The states remained within the Union. They had not actually left. And all that was necessary was to uh, put new governments in place somehow. In, in the southern states. And then they would enjoy their full normal rights under the Constitution. Um, this, this, this idea flowed uh, in part from the idea of secession as a kind of conspiracy of a fairly small group of southern leaders, with the mass of southerners not really pro-Confederate. But of course, this idea was very difficult to implement in practice from the very beginning the, the Union acted as if they were at a war with another country, not a, a sort of rebellion of individuals. Um, and also from the very beginning, radical Republicans did use the word Reconstruction, and they looked for something very different than just restoring the old Union. They saw the war as a golden opportunity to achieve what they and many other Republicans had thought about in some indefinite future, that is, a social revolution in the South, the end of slavery, and even more than that for some, the end of the planter class, or the end of the domination of the planter class. The establishment, in other words, of a free labor system in the South. Not just ending slavery, but revamping Southern society in the image of the North. In other words, with small farms rather than big plantations, with small towns, with industry, etc., cetera, um, and without slavery. And it, early in the war, in July 1861, Representative uh, James Ashley of Ohio, Major Radical, introduced a bill in Congress basically to establish territorial governments for the seceded states. This is, we'll talk about this down the road, this, this is based on what's called the state suicide theory. The states were still in the Union, but they had committed suicide as political entities by secession, according to Ashley. They had lapsed. They had gone back in time. They had lapsed back into the condition of territories. Um, now, this was a very um, uh, convenient uh, 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 approach for radicals because First of all, the Constitution gives Congress power over the territories, right? So Congress could run Reconstruction, not the President. Uh, second of all, they could do anything they want. They could abolish slavery, right? Part of the Republican point, platform of 1860 was there shouldn't be any slavery in the territories. Well, now suddenly they're all territories, so you can just abolish slavery there. It would be very convenient to do that. Uh, that bill didn't get anywhere. Another point of view which was expressed early in the war was that of Thaddeus Stevens, the great radical from Pennsylvania. We'll talk about him starting next week. Which was even more radical, which was the conquered provinces theory. That the South had actually left the Union. They had seceded. They were no longer part of the United States. And if defeated, they were conquered territories with which the country could do anything they wanted. In other words, they no longer had any constitutional status or constitutional rights. Now, Stevens, remember, will want to seize the land of the planter class and divide it up. You can do that more easily, legally, in a conquered province, maybe, than in a state or even a territory. So um, 
And certainly by 1862, many radical, well, maybe not so many radical, many abolitionists are already saying that, a, that Reconstruction must come with black suffrage, black male suffrage. The only way to establish what they call loyal government in the South will be by giving black men the right to vote. In other words, there aren't enough loyal white men in the South to actually have functioning pro-union governments. Now, a lot of water will have to pass under the bridge before black suffrage comes, but it's already being discussed in some circles early in the war. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation, among many other things, changes the debate on Reconstruction because it makes it clear that restoration is now <laughs> off the table, right? The South is not going to come back the way it was. The end of slavery is going to have to be part of the, end of the reuniting of the nation. How, in what form, not clear, but to be readmitted to the Union, the Southern states will have to accept the end of slavery. Um, that carries numerous implications, which nobody had really thought through in 1863. But the proclamation, among other things, leads to a split in the union movements in the border states. Remember the four border, actually if you look at our map up here, remember the border states, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and further to the west, Missouri, and now West Virginia too by 1863. The pro-union parties there split in two between radical unionists and conservative unionists. They're not secessionists, but the conservative unionists want to try to hang on to slavery in the border states, even while they're for the union. But radical unionists say, well, hey, emancipation is now the policy of the nation. We got to do this in our own states. And by the end of the war, internal revolutions have taken place in Maryland and Missouri, which have abolished slavery. Slavery ends in Maryland and Missouri through state action which was what Lincoln preferred most of the time. New groups take over, they win elections, they get governors, and they abolish slavery in those states. In Maryland, uh, sorry, in Delaware and Kentucky, though, slavery hangs on, the conservative unionists remain in control all the way uh, through the Civil War. Meanwhile, Lincoln wants to try to establish loyal governments or pro-union governments in the southern states. And he devotes a lot of time to the situation in Louisiana. Remember, New Orleans has been conquered, captured by the um, Union Navy in the spring of 1862, along with a pretty large area of southern Louisiana. And um, Lincoln, understood, Lincoln appoints military governors. He appoints a military, when the Union takes control of some parts of the South. Lincoln appoints, for example, General Benjamin Butler, remember, as military governor of Louisiana. That's not, you know, that's, that's not a civilian government, but he's military governor. In Tennessee, he appoints Andrew Johnson, who will then become the vice presidential candidate in 1864, we'll talk about that, um, as the military governor of Tennessee. And, he, and Lincoln encourages efforts to create civilian governments loyal to the Union. Lincoln understands that if you can detach a state from the Confederacy, that would be a giant victory. That would be better than winning a battle. You can actually get a state to repudiate secession and rejoin the Union, establish a functioning civilian government. So Lincoln is always trying to encourage that. And um, actually, at the end of 1862, Congressional elections are held in eastern Virginia and in southern Louisiana, and men are elected to go serve in Congress from those districts, and that's the reason that Lincoln exempts them from the Emancipation Proclamation. Remember, those parts of the Confederacy, the proclamation doesn't appeal to. He's trying to get white Southerners to be willing to join up with the Union again, and he uses emancipation as a kind of a a weapon in this, or he offers the exemption from emancipation as a way of encouraging the formation of governments there loyal to the Union. Um, now, he doesn't exempt, and we're going to talk about this place in a minute, the Sea Islands. Remember, look at our map here, the Sea Islands, the little islands down here between Charleston and Savannah off the coast of South Carolina. That's under Union control. He doesn't exempt it from the 
proclamation. Why? Because there's no white people there anymore. They have fled. There's nobody there to appeal to to set up a new civilian government. So what's the point of exempting it from the proclamation? So there, emancipation is immediate on January 1st, um, 1863.